motor just quit. Trapped in a burning plane. It was now a hole inside of the fuselage. And hurtling towards the ground. There was no hope. A skydiver with seconds to live. I could feel just life leaking out of me. Gets a glimpse of eternity. No, God, I'm sorry. I want to live. I want to be alive. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. For today's top stories, let's go over to the CBN News Desk. Gordon, terror warnings have America's military, federal agents, and police across the country on high alert this holiday weekend, and at least one celebration has been canceled. But officials stress they are not reacting to any one specific threat. From Los Angeles to New York City, America's police forces are fully deployed with state-of-the-art command centers and heavily armed units on the streets. <laughs> Thursday, police swarmed this Washington, D.C. Navy yard after reports of an active shooter. That call was a false alarm. We take every event here in Washington very serious, and our posture remains extremely high for all special events, and it will continue for the fourth. With troubling social media chatter from Islamic State terrorists, there are concerns the country is facing the most significant threat we've seen since the September 11th attacks. This year alone, police have arrested 40 people with suspected ties to ISIS, and seven of those arrests were made in just the last two weeks. Some 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the country have now been warned to be aware of lone wolf ISIS-inspired terrorists trying to stage attacks at large holiday gatherings. That warning has police in Tulsa, Oklahoma, reevaluating their emergency plans at a celebration that could draw nearly 100,000 people to this park. Every time there's a directive or there's some kind of chatter that occurs nationally and worldwide, and when it comes to our events, uh, we can't take the, the idea or the position that, hey, it's not gonna happen here. The concern is also raised following the recent terror attacks in France and Tunisia. The military has now canceled 4th of July celebrations at a U.S. air base in Lakenheath, England. And here at home, many people are a bit more watchful this holiday. Well, it's always in the back of your mind, let's face it. You know, you get on a plane, no matter what you do today, you've always got in the, in the back of your mind that something can happen. The police and military are not only patrolling the streets this holiday, there are forces in the water as well as the skies. The U.S. is stopping Middle East nations from arming the Kurds in the fight against ISIS. The British newspaper The Telegraph reports President Obama will not let U.S. allies in the Gulf ship heavy arms to the Kurdish fighters. The Obama administration requires all arms to go through the U.S.-backed government in Baghdad. Those weapons go to the Iraqi army, which has been driven back by ISIS, abandoning weapons to the Jihad army. The Kurdish fighting force, the Peshmerga, has successfully defended its territory from ISIS invaders. Another Democrat is making a run for the White House. Former Virginia Senator Jim Webb announced Thursday he is in the race. Webb says he'll bring an outsider's voice to a presidential race dominated by Hillary Clinton. He's a Vietnam War veteran and a former secretary of the Navy. His military experience may present a challenge to Clinton's foreign policy decisions as secretary of state. The jobless rate has fallen again down to 5.3 percent. Normally, that would be good news, but the rate is dropping mainly because more and more Americans have completely given up on trying to find a job. And the proportion of people looking for work shrunk as well, slipping to a 38-year low compared to the overall population. It all suggests rising discouragement about the economy. Freedom of religion is under fire at the state level after the Supreme Court ruling legalizing same-sex marriage. Four couples are suing a Kentucky clerk who is refusing to issue any marriage licenses because her Christian beliefs keep her from supporting gay marriage. In Texas, a judge is facing a lawsuit for declining a same-sex marriage license because of her religious beliefs. They're sending uh, Ms. Lang a letter today that if she does not issue the uh, license immediately, that we will move forward with the suit. Meanwhile, in Arkansas, Republican lawmakers are working on a plan to reinforce protections for churches, religious groups, and religious schools. A Virginia pastor is counting his blessings after his family survived a frightening incident aboard a plane. 
the twin-engine Cessna suffered a blown engine in midair. As Charlene Aaron reports, the family says the experience has taken their faith to new heights. Bishop Kim Brown of Mount Lebanon Baptist Church knows what it's like to build a ministry. When he became pastor in 1990, the church, also known as the Mount, had just 75 members. I would come to Bible study on Wednesday night and it would be three people. Since those early days, the church has grown to more than 9,000 with locations in both North Carolina and Virginia. Brown and his wife Valerie say trusting in the promises of God kept them going when times were tough. You just got to give all glory to God. That's just obviously the path that he had laid out for us. Little did Bishop Brown and his wife know that their faith would soon be put to the test in a way they could have never imagined. On May 29th, Valerie, the couple's daughter, son, daughter-in-law, and three-year-old grandson boarded a small plane for the grand opening of a new church plant in Charlotte, North Carolina. About 15 minutes into the flight, they saw smoke coming from the left wing of the plane, and the propeller stopped. We felt the bump and heard the boom. And so, you know, obviously everybody knew something was going on. One of the plane's engines had blown mid-flight. Valerie managed to send her husband a text message about what was happening and encouraged him to pray. Brown, who was driving when the text came through, pulled over. For a split second, mm -hmm. I just got this visual of five caskets at the altar. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. oh no. My prayer was not deep. It was, <laughs> Lord, that's my family. Got the pilot, got the plane. Angels, take care of my family, God. You know, this is my family. Yeah. The pilot informed the family he would attempt to return to the airport and land the plane. Still praying, Valerie and her family held on to hope. Yet for a split second, she too thought it might be the end. I said, yeah. oh my God, I can't believe, you know, that we could potentially go down or it could explode. Right. And I think that's what took me into my prayer moment. Um, and it was at that moment that I felt that peace that I prayed for. The plane was finally able to safely land at the same airport it had taken off from, shaken up, but no one hurt. Brown met up with his family at the airport where they shared hugs and tears of joy. I said, well, let's go home and get in the living room and get on our knees as a family and just thank God for the miracle of this day. Thanks also shared by the pilot, who was also glad to be part of the miracle after 40 years of flying. And he said, you know, it was like angels were just it holding was. the plane up. Meanwhile, Valerie says she is grateful for God's sovereign grace and encourages others to live a life of faith. Be sure that you're prepared at moments like this so that you're not afraid, you know, that you don't have to run to the altar and say, forgive right. me, God. Say, you know, I right. love you to everyone that you love and ask yeah. for forgiveness and, you know, just live in the moment as if it could be your last moment. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. And those are today's top stories from CBN News. Gordon and Terrell will be back with the rest of today's 700 Club right after this. Sex trafficking is a multi-billion dollar criminal industry and the world is slowly waking up to this modern day form of slavery and looking for ways to fight it. As Caitlin Burke reports, a clothing company in London is helping victims of the sex industry and they're doing it one stitch at a time. Sonagachi is the largest sex district in Kolkata, India. Each day, more than 10,000 women stand in line to sell their bodies. Some enter the world of human trafficking so their families can eat or because poverty has left them with no other option. These images and stories change the lives of volunteers Lady Natasha Rufus Isaacs and Lavinia Brennan back in 2009. A lot of the local slum, slum girls would come to this really small production unit in the afternoons, but that was so that you know, they wouldn't be abused in the afternoon by the men sort of in, in their village. We were teaching them how to kind of sew and, and taught them very basic skills. Um, so it was from there that we had the idea then to set up the business. We both, we, we love fashion, we love dresses, we love dressing up. And sort of working in the production unit in the afternoons, we realised that actually it would be amazing to help teach women skills that then, you know, would make them employable or to help them live a sort of sustainable alternative livelihood. Um, and I think as two girls, we thought, 
let's go into fashion. <laughs> and that they did, starting an ethical fashion label that's making a worldwide name for itself, thanks in part to one major high-profile customer, Kate Middleton, Duchess of Cambridge. Beulah London customers come in looking for an outfit that will make them look and feel beautiful. They leave with a purchase that's making a difference. When we sort of first started the company, um, the vision was to have the women involved in the whole of the production. But as we sort of grow, we realized that, that wasn't quite possible given their skill set. Um, and if you can imagine, the average age of a girl being trafficked is 13. So there's a lot of healing that has to go on before she can sort of go into employment. Um, so we decided to start small and um, partner up with, with co companies or businesses that were working on the ground with women who've been trafficked. Um, so like Freeset. The organization known as Freeset works to help Indian women escape the sex trade. They not only teach useful skills, but empowerment as well. Rufus Isaacs and Brennan partner with Freeset. Customers can purchase Beulah canvas bags, which are produced directly by former trafficking victims. They've also started the Beulah Trust, which provides money for women to learn skills like embroidery. From next season as well, we'll have the embroidery that we want to have on every single piece. So then every single piece has a story in a way and has had like the hand of the woman make, make and embroider. The embroidery will be the Beulah logo two bees in the shape of a butterfly. The butterfly effect, so the idea of, of one small um, one small thing having a large effect, or one small change having a large effect elsewhere. And I suppose that also relates back to Beulah and what Beulah stands yeah. for in the Bible. is talks about coming out of a place of darkness into freedom. It's the concept of the butterfly becoming something beautiful out of darkness. So. The women who originally inspired these beautiful dresses continue to be at the heart of every design. Every theme also relates slightly to the charity side. Last season's design was kintsugi, a type of Japanese pottery. It's the concept of um, a piece of pottery being broken and then put back together with gold kind of liqueur. So the idea that the piece is more beautiful for having been broken. Mm. So we had kind of within the collection, we had these like beautiful kind of um, prints with this like gold crack in it. One day, each Beulah London piece will carry the touch of a woman they're working to save. Until then, you can be sure that every purchase still makes a difference. If someone buys into the brand, then obviously that's helping us as a brand grow. And that's when we really feel like we can have a big impact. It's a company with a cause, and they're creating a beautiful change, one stitch at a time. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, London. A oh, wonderful story, wonderful concept using fashion to end the sex industry in India. Well, you can find out more about both Beulah London and Freeset by just going to cbnnews.com. Terry? Well, up next, a skydiver takes a trip up to heaven. This was a real place. And I was also traveling like on an upward glide path. And I saw a white portal in the distance and I felt a piece about emanating from it. So I was heading towards there. Find out what he saw when he got there after this. Well, as a professional skydiver, Mickey Robinson had no fear. Until the day his plane began plunging to the ground. The parachute, designed to save Mickey's life, became a death trap when it burst into flames and sent Mickey into a supernatural destination. The first time you open your parachute, it's pretty amazing. It's so peaceful, the panorama, you're hanging a half a mile above the earth, and so it wasn't about the adrenaline, it was about the pleasure. It was about the pleasure of being in free fall and feeling like you could fly. Mickey Robinson was a professional skydiver. He loved falling from the heavens and drifting safely to earth. But one day, just after takeoff for a practice jump, the plane's engine stalled, hurling Mickey and his companions toward the ground at over 100 miles an hour. The motor just quit, and we had an aerodynamic stall, so there was no hope. He had seconds, and 
and we impacted. The plane hit the ground and cartwheeled to a stop. With my leg sticking out, what was now a hole inside of the fuselage, and with my hand I was pulling, but something had a hold of my equipment, and I was trapped, and I was soaked with airplane gasoline and on fire from head to toe. His friend fought through the flames and pulled Mickey out. In severe pain and losing consciousness, Mickey asked God for help. For the first time in my life, a man that was totally self-sufficient, I relied on my own natural ability, my own strength. For the first time in my life, I called out to a God I didn't know and never served. I just said, God, please help me. I'm sorry, give me another chance. At the hospital, it was quickly evident to the doctors that his chances of survival were not good. They didn't think I'd make it through the night. They thought I'd die of shock. I had head trauma, massive lacerations, tremendous burns over my body. I had some internal injuries they didn't really, really know about. My organs were actually shutting down. I had sepsis, that's interior infection all over the inside of your lining of your body. And my body was fighting a battle that in the natural, there was no way it could win. I could feel just life leaking out of me. At that point, I had an experience. I had no grid for this at all. My inner being, my spirit man, went perpendicular to my body and I was like immediately ejected and transported and I, I all of a sudden was thrust into a spiritual dimension. I looked at myself and there was nothing wrong with me. This was a real place. And I was also traveling, I, was, I had no control of what was going on. I was like on an upward glide path and I saw a white portal in the distance and I felt a piece about emanating from it. So I was heading towards there and then I felt a pressure like on my right side, just as I was about there and I looked and I looked into something I can only describe as blacker, an abyss that was blacker than black. This was eternal. This thing, the more I looked at it, the more it closed to where it was, I was almost by this white portal and it was eclipsing it. And I cried out the same clumsy, desperate thing. I'd sit in the, in the ambulance, in the emergency room, on the operating table. I said, no, God, I'm sorry. I wanna live, I wanna be alive. And as those words gushed out, desperately out of my spirit, I was thrust through this white portal and instantly I was standing in the presence of Almighty God and I knew I would never die. It transcended everything I knew or could imagine about the most great things in the world. It went above and beyond all, anything I could imagine. The love of God is just, it's so pure, it's so perfect, it's so incredible. And I, I didn't see any creatures, I didn't see any angels, I didn't see the pearly gates, Peter checking IDs and all this stuff and people's concepts, I didn't see any of that. But the glory of God, the, the radiance of God, but mostly God himself and the magnificence of his love, the undiluted love of God was being poured into me. There was nothing negative allowed to be in the presence of God. So I was pure and I was innocent. And it's so incredible, the ecstasy, the bliss, the joy, all the stuff we've read about, when you really experience it, we don't have words. We're gonna have to invent new words. <laughs> Despite wanting to stay in heaven, Mickey says he was sent back to his body. My spirit came back from the presence of God, came to the hospital, sank into my body, much like when a person would slip a glove on their hand. And I was so full of life and love. And around the bed was about a half a dozen doctors and nurses. And I had this ability to know what they were experiencing. They just, they just saw me die and come back to life. <laughs> and they were scared of what they saw. And there I am, what was ever left of my face had a silly grin. I was, I was full of joy. I was so happy to be alive. And I had, I had this love and I didn't know what to call it, but I loved everybody and everything. Mickey says from that day on, he began to see God working miracles in his life. Doctors said he would not be able to walk again due to the nerve damage in his legs, but the nerves regenerated. And after five years of blindness in his right eye, his sight was restored. Part of God's love is his, rest, his ability to restore and everything that was lost, he's been restoring. And you really appreciate your life when it's restored. And I think any amount of restoration, we need to really thank God for it. And to think that the huge amount of restoration I have, I need to be grateful every day. He wrote a book detailing his experiences called Falling Into Heaven. Mickey says of all the miracles he has been a part of in his life, it is God's love that has meant the most to him. I'm blown away that God loves me. I'm blown away that I, God took a mess and made a masterpiece out of it, not my masterpiece, his. Mickey has traveled the world proclaiming the love of God and the healing power of Jesus that he has experienced during his second chance at life on earth. There's only one path to God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead are raised, 
I didn't have leprosy, but I did have pretty bad skin problems. And he binds up the brokenhearted. If we did a forensic study and checked all the fingerprints, it would only add up to Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nobody else could do this but Jesus Christ. No one else can do it but Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, how do you get that? How do you get access to the Father? How do you get access to that glorious light, that glorious love? It, what Mickey went through, the Bible talks about. The Apostle John said, God is love. He said, God is light. In him there is no darkness. There's no doubt. There's no unbelief. There's no uh, uh, negativity. All things are possible when you're in contact with him. What Mickey experienced, you can have as well. What's the key? What's the answer? It's the same prayer that Mickey prayed. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to know you. Jesus promises that he'll manifest himself. He'll show up for you. He'll turn that light on so you understand. He'll give you that same love that same acceptance, that same everything. You can have it all if you just ask. If you just say, Jesus, I want this. I want you. I want you in my life. I don't want my way anymore. I want to be your masterpiece. The plan, the purpose that you have for me, that's what I want. And if you pray that with all of your heart, the Bible says, that he'll be found by you. When you seek him, he'll be found by you. That's why Jesus says you need to ask, you need to knock, and you need to keep on asking and keep on knocking until you get it, until you have that experience of him. And once you have it, then all things become new. Things change, you change. Your perception changes. From your innermost being, you see things differently now. And you can have it by just praying that same prayer. If you want this, if you want to meet God today, if you want to know that Jesus is real, all you have to do is ask. So let's do that. Don't turn away. Don't change the channel. But let's pray. And let's believe God that what he did for Mickey, he'll do for you. He's able to heal. He's able to restore. He's able to change your heart. He's able to do all of these things. But the greatest thing is his love towards you. He keeps no record of wrongs. He has good thoughts about you. He has a plan and a future for you. All you have to do is ask him. So let's pray. Bow your head. Close your eyes, and let's see what Jesus will do for you today. Let's pray. Jesus, that's right. Say his name and say it out loud. Don't let this be a silent prayer, but say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you, and I want you in my life, in my heart, I want to know your love. I want to feel your presence now. And Jesus, I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you change my heart. I ask that you fill me with your love. And I ask that you do all of these things so that I can follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer. Answer it now, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that your face would shine upon them and that your peace would be on them. 
transform them, fill them, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to go to the phone and make a toll-free call, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to say that I prayed. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So do that now. 1-800-759-0700. When you call, I've got something free for you. It's a CD teaching on what do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? What do Christians believe? What are the pillars of the faith? It's all free. No financial obligation at all. Make the call now. 1-800-759-0700. Terry, over to you. Still ahead, a woman is desperate to have a baby. I took my temperature every day to see where my body was in its cycle. And when I would get that dip, it was just like I had completely failed. I want to be the one who takes my baby home. Watch how this wife becomes a mother. That's coming up. But first, a Holocaust survival, a survivor tells how he was hidden in a bag to escape the Nazis. We have his harrowing story still to come. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Lawyers for Asia Bibi say she is on the verge of death. Bibi is a 43-year-old Christian mother who's being held in a Pakistan prison because of her Christian faith. According to Mission Network News, she has internal bleeding, abdominal pain, and is vomiting blood. Her attorneys say if she doesn't get medical care, she could soon die. Bibi is serving a life sentence accused of blaspheming Muhammad. Her supporters are requesting prayer on her behalf. As Nepal braces for monsoon season, Operation Blessing continues relief efforts in areas affected by a devastating earthquake earlier this year. Many of those affected are still living in makeshift tents. Operation Blessing is providing communities with clean drinking water, cooking supplies, blankets, mosquito nets, and shelter materials. They're also sending a medical team every week to treat the sick and injured in remote villages without access to health care. You can always find out more about Operation Blessing by going to its website. It's ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club. That's coming up right after this. Ephraim Bronstein has vivid memories of the Holocaust, even though he was just a small child at the time. Today, Ephraim lives in Israel, where he receives ongoing help Thanks to people like you. Ephraim Bronstein was only one year old when the Holocaust began. He doesn't remember much about it, but his relatives tell him he's lucky to be alive. In 1941, his family was forced to live in a ghetto in their native Ukraine. Then, his father was sent to war to fight for Germany, while his mother was forced to do hard labor. While his mom worked, he was kept safe by an 11-year-old girl. She hid me inside a bag so that the Germans wouldn't take us while our parents were away. Life in the ghetto was harsh. All we had to eat was rotten beets. Sometimes the Germans forced me to clean the street. Every day they shot people who lived in the ghetto. They took some away to the guest chambers. There was little protection from the bitter cold. Lack of food and warmth made Ephraim sick, and he never recovered. I have hypertension, I have diabetes, and I have heart problems. Today, living in Israel, his life is still difficult. Ephraim lives in poverty, like many Holocaust survivors. So CBN Israel gives Ephraim food baskets each month. He looks forward to every delivery because he needs the food and enjoys the time spent with volunteers. I like when people visit former ghetto prisoners like me. We are lonely and don't get much attention. Ephraim's stove was broken and he couldn't afford to fix it. So he took him shopping, bought him a new stove and delivered it to his home. And we got him a microwave too. I want to say thank you for coming and bringing me such a wonderful gift. Thank you very much. And thank you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that. If you're not a member, join with us. Join in everything we're doing around the world. Call us now, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to join. How much is it? 
It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. When you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving where the bank does all the work. There's no checks to write, nothing to mail in. We save so much on the processing, we can send Power for Life monthly teaching CDs to you. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call. And if you have a heart for Israel, and I know many of you do, we have a special fund called CBN Israel. Uh, and there's the address for it, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. And you can designate 100% of your gift to CBN Israel to help people in Israel uh, do humanitarian aid, bring in news broadcasts from Israel, do wonderful documentaries about Israel, all made possible because people give to the CBN Israel Fund. So do it now, 1-800-759-0700. Terry? Well, up next, when a woman wakes up after surgery, her doctor tells her that she has breast cancer. Then he tells her she's pregnant. My first thought was, really, God, if you knew I had cancer, why would you allow me to get pregnant? And something inside of me just said, he must have an awesome plan if he would allow this. See how that plan unfolds. Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs when we come back. Stay with us. Melody Dillard found out she had breast cancer. She also found out she was pregnant. For years, she and her husband Rob had struggled with infertility after the death of their first baby. And now, another child they had longed for was in jeopardy, just like Melody herself. Rob and I were in our early 20s when we discovered that we were pregnant. We were both shocked and afraid. We automatically start thinking the future what does it hold for the both of us? Even though it wasn't something we planned, I was excited. 24 weeks, Melody's water broke. We rushed to the hospital, and they immediately started injecting me in both arms every 30 minutes trying to stop the labor. That baby was coming, and there wasn't anything we could do about it. And I gave birth to a very tiny, very tiny baby girl that night. One pound, nine ounces. Late in the lease. You want to just scoop her up and hold her, and there was no way that was going to happen. In my heart, I just knew that the Lord was going to heal her and everything was going to be fine. And we got that phone call. She had developed an infection. She was gray, she was very frail, and you could tell that she was fighting for her life. I cried out to the Lord and I said, you can heal her, I know you can heal her. watched them remove all the tubes and patches and everything that covered her body. And they wrapped her in a blanket and they placed her in my arms. And that was the last time that I would hold my baby. How are we going to keep it all together? How was I going to consult her? We weren't prepared. I just thought if I could get pregnant again, then that would fill that void. I had gotten pregnant so easily the first time, so I thought, I would get pregnant the first or second try. But since I was grieving so deeply, the doctor said that my body had actually shut down and that I wasn't ovulating. We tried pretty much anything under the sun. If somebody had a recommendation, had an idea, we did anything we could. Rob would give me injections in my stomach or in my hips every month. I took my temperature every day to see where my body was in its cycle. And when I would get that dip, it was just like I had completely failed. Once again, I wasn't pregnant. I watched so many of my friends have their second and their third child while I waited. Why not us? We want a child just as bad as they do. We, we promise we're going to be good parents. My mom used to say, well, Melody, you're going to be able to help somebody else one day. And I would cry and I would say, I don't care. I don't want to be that person. I want to be the one who takes my baby home. And then I met my niece on February 18th, 1994. And it was hard. It was really hard to look at her, but she was an angel. And I told the Lord, I want to praise you even when my circumstances don't. A year later, we found out that we were expecting. I think I was probably the happiest pregnant woman walking. 
When they laid him in my arms, it was absolutely love at first sight. Looks just like me. <laughs> Rob and I were both overjoyed to be parents, but I still was not ready to let go of that dream of having a little girl. We tried for several years and we didn't have any luck. I started to wonder, what if I was to get pregnant? What if something would happen to me? And I began to pray, Lord, I trust you. If I never get pregnant again, I trust that you know something I don't. We just completely put it in the Lord's hands. And then in January of 2001, Rob found a lump in my left breast. He scheduled surgery for January 22nd. And when I came to, my husband and the surgeon were standing there. And we have to tell her she had breast cancer and she was pregnant. My first thought was, really, God, if you knew I had cancer, why would you allow me to get pregnant? And something inside of me just said, he must have an awesome plan if he would allow this. What if I get in his way? What if I don't trust him enough to see it through? I had a mastectomy. I started taking treatments. She's just feeling horrible. Then, you know, I have my son. I have to explain to him that his mom is going to lose her hair. The year that I had cancer was one of the most peaceful times of my life, and it's hard to imagine that. I was bald and pregnant and had one breast. But once we surrendered everything to the Lord, it was amazing to watch Him work. Pregnancy continued. Baby was a little small. We were told that premature delivery was a risk with chemotherapy. Just give me a healthy baby. Ten fingers, ten toes. That's, that's all I want. September 20th. It was so peaceful and fun, if labor can be, can be fun. She was so beautiful. My wife was so beautiful. To finally be holding my daughter in my arms, it was like God was answering an 11-year-old prayer. The doctors say that had I gotten pregnant, before I was diagnosed, they probably wouldn't have found the lump. I think that's so God orchestrated. Romans 8, 28 tells us that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. When I was walking through all of that, I could not see any good in the suffering that God was allowing in my life. I was so hurt and I was so angry with the Lord. It was more important for me to be miserable than it was to honor God. Now, when I think about the scripture, Romans 8, 28, I look at it completely different than I did when I lost Leighton, because I can see now that God takes the hurts and He takes the disappointments and all of our pain and even our sin, and He turns it into something beautiful. He has an amazing plan for you, too. I know there are many of you who every day wait for time of prayer on this program, and we want to pray for you right now, and we want to encourage your faith. If that didn't encourage you enough watching that amazing story, here's another story that I'd like to share with you. Gordon, this is Rosanna from Fontana, California. She was diagnosed with COPD, could hardly breathe or sleep. Doctors prescribed medication, but nothing really worked. She thought she was going to die and consider going to the emergency room. Instead, she turned on the 700 Club and heard you say, there's somebody you've got burning in your lungs and it's a severe asthma condition very difficult for you to breathe and there's constricted breathing almost on a continuous continual basis god is restoring you right now you just felt that go into your lungs take in a deep breath realize you're free it's never going to come back you're set free now you're healed now she's been able to breathe ever since with no inhaler and she is praising god for that miracle that is a miracle is doctors a miracle. will tell you copd <laughs> can't be cured. There's nothing medically they can do. But with God, all things are possible. Here's another one. William from West Columbia, South Carolina. He had a rash on his feet. It looked like they had been burned. Then the problem spread to his arms. He saw a dermatologist, but the doctor couldn't explain what was causing the condition. The rash continued for several months without let up. 
Then he was watching the 700 Club and he heard Terry give a word of knowledge. You have a burning skin condition. I don't think it's from a burn. It's something that causes your skin to feel like it's burning. God is healing your tissue. It's all being healed and made whole. Mm -hmm. William claimed the word, and when he awoke the next morning, the rash was totally gone. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. God wants to work miracles. Now, now consider that, and consider what that means. That means that if there aren't any struggles, then there aren't any victories. When, when you look at his glory and the miracles, that means there has to be something wrong. But he's all about fixing the world. He's all about that. That's what he wants to do. Now, now look back in time. Go back all the way to the Garden of Eden. What was God's plan? God's plan was for you and me to live in a garden He'd come down in the cool of the evening and talk with us. He didn't intend for there any, to be any tears. He, he didn't intend for any of that. We're the ones that messed it up. We're the ones that fell from his grace, his glory. But the good news is God hasn't given up on that dream. He still wants to fix things. He's all about restoration. He wants to restore us. He wants us to be with him in heaven. Now, start thinking about heaven. What's that going to be like? Are there going to be any tears? Anybody going to be lonely? Anybody going to be needy? Is there any need for healing? No. So when we look at heaven, we look at God's will. That's, that's where his will is being done. And we're authorized to pray that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So often we get trapped in the theology of what's going wrong. And this happened in the Bible as well, where the disciples brought a man born blind to Jesus. And they had a theological question. Well, this blindness is a result of sin. Who sinned? Was it him? He's born blind. Was there some sin he was going to do that was so horrible that he needed to be born blind? Or was it the sin of his parents? Did they cause this? And if they cause this, where's the justice in that? Because he's paying for it, and they're not paying for it, he's paying for it. I love the response of Jesus. He said, neither. This happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed, and he healed the blindness. So start thinking that way, that whatever struggle you're going through, whatever problem, start thinking, this happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. This happened that the will of God, the will of him in heaven, would come down on earth and be in my body right now. Now, you're authorized to pray that. Start believing it. Start confessing it. Terry and I are going to pray. We're going to believe that God's will would be done in your body right now. And let's get rid of all theological discussion Let's get rid of all doubt and unbelief and just focus on him, focus on heaven, and ask for his will to be done now. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we lift up the needs of the audience and as people are in pain, people are suffering with disease. Lord, we just declare over them, this is not your will. This isn't something that you want for them, that your will in heaven is for us to be disease-free, for us to have prosperity, for us to enjoy life that you've given us, for us to enjoy every breath. That's your will. So with the authority given to us as believers, you have given us the power to be your children, we come to you, our Father, and we declare that your will would be done in these bodies now, that your will would come to earth and be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heal them now, restore them. Let every fiber of their being resonate with your will. 
and let everything come into compliance with your will, be healthy, be restored, and be whole now in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a um, muscular dystrophy and you're, you're literally you're wasting away. God's restoring every muscle fiber in your body. He's restoring every nerve. He is making you whole in Jesus' name. Just receive it now. Believe it in Jesus' name. Terry? There's someone else. You have these little, like, tumors. They're, they're just sm not small lumps. They're like the size of like a large grape, but they're everywhere, under your arms, on your neck. I God is healing that for you. What medicine has not been able to do for you, those are just going to begin to melt away as God restores your health to you. There's someone else you have an issue with your back. Um, it, it doesn't allow you to actually stand up straight. A lot of pain in the lower back. That's just lift up now. God's setting you free from that. Now there's someone with an infection in your, uh, the fluid in the membrane of your brain. Uh, and it's um, originated in your spinal cord and it's now in your brain. God's healing you. He's setting you free from that. He's restoring you, completely restoring you in Jesus' name. Someone else with a neck injury caused by a motorcycle accident. It's on your right side. of. Very difficult for you to move. Uh, you live in constant pain. God's healing you. He's restoring the vertebra in your neck. What what doctors say will never happen is happening for you now. And you're going to be able to turn your neck, have complete mobility in it. Nothing ever, like it's never happened to you. God's healing you now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been touched by God, we want to share in your good report. So give us a call, 1-800-759-0700. We leave you these words from Jeremiah. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me and I shall be saved, for you are my prey.